All right, so when the uh, Founding Fathers uh, took a look at that human nature, they, they realized we need, a, we need a new form of government. Um, now, when, when, they, when they did this, they were also keeping in mind the abuses of the English government. So they need a government that deals with this issue of domination for lust and power. That's what they had experienced under, under George III. Um, that a government that was too powerful, that sought to control them in, in uh, most, many of the fundamental things that they did, in which they had no representation. And so they create the Articles of Confederation th from the perspective of, coming from the perspective of a government that was too powerful. And so when they created it, that's, that's their frame of reference. So they created um, a a legislature. Now remember, it, it, it is a confederation. Let me just stop us right there for a second. A confederation is an alliance of independent states. Uh, so in those days, you weren't an American so much as you were a Virginian or a, or a Georgian uh, or, or a West Virginian or a New Yorker. That was your country. You, those, those different countries joined this confederation for their mutual defense. So one of the things that happens with the confederation, an alliance of independent states joins together for limited purposes, usually one of them being defense. Um, okay, so they, they create this Articles of Confederation where these 13 independent countries um, in, in the world today, we call, um, the world calls countries states. In the United States, it's easy for us to get confused because we look at the 50 states, which are like 50 independent countries, but we are united under the Constitution that we have now, which we will eventually come to. So the, these 13 independent states form a confederation, and there's going to be a government over this confederation, a limited government, so it doesn't become too powerful because that's the kind of government they had with uh, George III in England, un under English rule. So they create a legislature. And the legislature is going to be, be composed of a one-house Congress, unicameral, unicameral. Now, in, in the English Parliament, you had uh, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. There was going to be no nobility, no titles. So a one-house Congress. Um, each state, regardless of size, would have one, the, one vote. Now, this is a big deal. It is not the people who are being represented here in the Articles of Confederation. It is the states. The states are joining a confederation for the purposes, mostly at this point, of uh, protection against England, breaking away from England. So it is the states who are represented, not people. So it doesn't matter if you're from Rhode Island with very limited people or from uh, New York or Virginia. Um, each, you are one, one state, so you get one vote. That's a big deal. It required a two-thirds majority, or nine of 13 states, to pass a law in this legislature. Um, so not just a simple majority. Um, they wanted to, there to be, a, not unanimity, but, but something that almost every state could agree to before they'd pass the law. Um, as far as an executive... Uh, branch of government. There was to be no executive. Now, any government, whether it is a dictatorship or a democracy, does three things. Uh, they make law, they enforce law, and they interpret law. So, so again, because of the abuses of George III, they said, well, you know what, maybe we can stop these uh, abuses if we just don't have an executive whose functions, function it is to enforce the law. So that, that was their thinking. So they went from a government that was extremely powerful and intentionally created a government that was uh, less powerful, even weak, uh, to prevent that new government from abusing their rights. They also knew that you needed somebody to interpret the law, the judicial branch. But again, because of the, the um, abuses of the English government, they said, we won't have a central or a federal court system um, what we would call a federal court system today, in, in, in the Articles of Confederation, you might say a confederate uh, system would be better, better put right here. Let me just put that in.
uh, that we won't have a confederate court system. We will have the state governments perform the function. So when a, a law needs to be interpreted, when there is a, um, a suit to be had, this will be a function of the state governments that will have to decide. This will again put a, a check on this confederation power. Um, so bottom line here, Congress was the only branch of government and it was weak and intentionally or purposely designed to be so. Um, based on their experience with Georgia III, this is what they wanted. This was a reaction to what had happened there. Um, there was also no executive and no judicial, therefore no power to act on individuals. If you don't have an executive to enforce the law or a judicial branch to interpret the law, you in effect have no power to act on individuals and you have no, no power to enforce the laws that this Congress, the, this, this uh, Articles of Confederation Congress created. Um, so those were some serious concerns, in retrospect, some serious concerns that they should have had. But again, this was a reaction to what had happened under George III. Now, they knew that they would also need to occasionally amend the Articles of Confederation. And so, um, again, th this was a, a contract between 13 independent states. And so if this contract was to be changed, they believed everybody should agree. So there had to have, they had to have unanimity. They had to be unanimous in changing this social compact. Remember, remember what Locke said, people join together to create a society, to create a social contract, he called it. And so if we're going to change this social contract, everybody again ought to agree. And so in their Articles of Confederation uh, Constitution, their charter, they required unanimity, everybody having agreed to amend the Articles of Confederation. Consequently, the Articles of Confederation were never amended. This turned out to be a curse and a blessing the way it was a curse was the articles were never amended and they needed to be amended they needed to have an executive and, and a judicial branch but since unanimity was required they could never reach it this was also a blessing because since they couldn't be since since they never were amended and it was unlikely that they would ever be amended given the fact that there was usually at least one state refusing to do so on fundamental issues um, this is one of the issue, one of the reasons uh, that we moved to Philadelphia and had the what became known as the Constitutional Convention. So it was a blessing and a curse that the Articles of Confederation were never amended. There was also some powers lacking um, in the Articles of Confederation that that seriously crippled the new nation. One of those powers lacking was the power to regulate commerce. Any country needs the ability to regulate commerce. Afraid again of the power of George III, the Founding Fathers refused to grant this power in the Articles of Confederation uh, Constitution. And there was no power for this Confederation to tax. All they could do was request that the states send them money. And, and the Articles of Confederation a constitution lacking these two powers it just crippled the new nation we became the ugly duckling of the international community and and what happened was a period uh, a, a number of years known as the critical period uh, uh, this lasted this lasted from the time of um, the articles confederation even a little before it we were right in the middle of of the revolutionary war um, until um, the Constitution took effect in 1789, um, so you're looking at, you're looking at a, a little over 20 years as as um, this being a serious problem in the United States. So, <clears throat> because of the powers left um, out of the Articles of Confederation Congress, there was no power to regulate trade of uh, commerce, um, not only within this Confederation but also with foreign powers. And so what these foreign powers were doing, particularly England, was they were tearing us apart, playing us, pitting us against each other. 
There was no power over commerce. And so the state quarreled amongst themselves with tariffs um, uh, from, from uh, about a 500-mile stretch in, in, uh, between, two, uh, between about three states. There were 11 tariffs that were charged. So this crippled business, every time you, you, you go on a road and you've got to pay a tariff, it, it just raises the cost of things, um, makes it more difficult for anybody to make a profit, and it just began to cripple the United States. And so what James Madison did, James Madison knew that there were problems. A lot of people knew that there were problems. And so James Madison said, hey, we've got to get together and we've got to talk about this and see what we can do to fix it. And so um, he proposed um, and, and he invited all the states to at Annapolis, Maryland for a meeting in September of 1786. Um, that's what he did. That's what he did. Thinking, okay, maybe the states can get together and agree to something to fix this. So September 17th, 1876 came around, and we get the Maryland and Annapolis meeting. Um, problem, only five states show up. Only five states sent delegates to fix the problem. One of the states that sent delegates was Virginia, and the man they sent was, sent was Alexander Hamilton. He snatched victory out of the jaws of defeat at this Maryland Annapolis meeting by saying, hey, why don't we use this as a springboard to call for another meeting a year from now? Uh, and let's do, at that meeting, let's revise the Articles of Confederation. Having no other option, um, because this meeting had utterly failed, they agreed to do that. So these delegates of these five states called for another meeting in a year. So it would be 1787, in which the purpose would be to revise the Articles of Confederation. Problem. Problem. What makes them think anybody else is going to show up? Now, as you're thinking about that, let me just tell you a little bit about Alexander Hamilton and, and, and where, he has, where he is at in American history. Think of the $1 bill. Who is on it? Think of the 5. Who is on it? Think of the 10. Who is on it? Think of the 20. Who is on it? Think of the 100. Who is on it? Uh, think of the $2 bill. Who is on it? So now let's go back and look. The $1 bill, George Washington, a president of the United States. The $2 bill, Thomas Jefferson, a president of the United States. The $5 bill, Al uh, Abraham Lincoln, a president of the United States. The $10 bill, Alexander Hamilton, never a president. The $20 bill, Jackson, a president. The $50 bill, Grant, a president. The $100 bill, Benjamin Franklin, never a president. This, this shows you a little bit about uh, the regard and the, the service that both Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin offered this country in, early, in the early days, in, in its early days. All right, so the problem, again, the problem, to restate the problem, they've called for another meeting a year later in Philadelphia, which will be 1787. The problem is, what makes them think anybody will even show up? We'll end this video there, and you can think about that while you go to the next video.